Hey, welcome back to Brandon Wilborn's Fantasy Fiction Podcast, where fans of classic fantasy adventures can hear the serialized audiobooks of a fellow nerd and indie author completely for free. I'm your author, narrator, and host, Brandon Wilborn, and I say to you, Aida Aloha. It's just a greeting I made up because I grew up in Hawaii, and I live in Idaho now. And I love both. So, like the popular song said when I was leaving Hawaii, you can take the boy out of the island, but not the island from the boy. Maybe later in this episode, you'll understand how my brain can come up with a mashup like Idaloha. But in all seriousness, thank you for joining me. The story portion of this episode starts at about the minute 20 mark. Last week in The Treasure of Caprick, the boys and Louise fled from their fight with Captain Fallon, who quickly set soldiers on their trail. When Curian's group reached the abandoned village of Smithfield, they encountered their dean, Noman Goodman who revealed that Evasius had destroyed their compound and killed everyone at Caprick Hill. This week I'll be reading Chapter 7. Following that, there'll be a behind-the-keyboard segment about some of the names in the story. Now I present for your enjoyment, The Treasure of Caprick. Chapter 7. Sacrifices. Curian slept fitfully. Memories of his brothers rushing to put out fires around the compound played out whether his eyes were open or closed. When he nodded off, the memories turned into nightmares in which the monks burned along with their home. Tobin sobbing nearby woke him as often as the dreams did, and the twitching muscles of his legs prevented him from reaching a deep sleep, despite his exhaustion. It reminded him of the first time he had experienced that feeling, another time of loss and confusion. When he first arrived at the order, the young novitiates ran up and down the hill every day until they vomited and their legs collapsed under them. Then they wrestled and sparred, learning the soft points of the body that allowed a child to escape an adult attacker. The twitching had kept him awake, giving him the only time to think about why his father had abandoned him to strangers who worked young boys beyond exhaustion and punished every misstep with a swat from the rod. He wept often in those first months, before he accepted the oath of the order. Eventually, the nighttime muscle spasms faded, replaced with the feeling of movement even when lying still in his bunk. The spasms returned after they passed ten years of age, when every twelfth week was devoted to battle. They slept in shifts, ate siege rations, and faced random attacks by brothers acting as an enemy force. They did not pull their punches. It was all to prepare them for their task as protectors. Every siege week, his muscles would twitch again at night. Eventually, he grew accustomed to it. He knew his body would also adapt to the new strain of walking such a great distance each day with a full pack. None of them stirred when the sky started to lighten. Curian knew that he did not want to be the first one up this morning. To his surprise, Noman was the first to move. The dean did not look like he had slept well either. His whole face was swollen, and he glared out through bloodshot eyes. His short gray hair, normally combed down neatly, stuck out at all angles like a bramble bush. Seeing his teacher so disheveled rekindled the fire of terror in Curian's gut. Noman had always been orderly and neat in everything. Discipline is the key to a peaceful spirit, was his favorite phrase when correcting an impulsive novitiate, and he proved it through his stoicism. Now Curian had seen him lose all control of his emotions more proof that the Order had lost its power long before and that their show of strength was a fragile facade waiting for the shattering blow from Avasius. Noman cleared his throat and smoothed down his hair with his hand. Boys, he said softly, I know you are awake. We must talk. Reese propped himself up against the bridge and Tobin sat up and crossed his legs. What's there to talk about? Curian said as he started rolling up his blanket. To start, I would like to hear about your mission to Pollingham, Noman answered. He had the same tone he used when he asked them to recite a passage of important script from memory. We are still working on it. What happened at your meeting with Lord Avasius? He claimed the raid on the compound was all a misunderstanding about trying to collect taxes, Curian said, and began to load packs onto Greta. But our order is exempt from taxes said Noman in surprise. He was going to change that, Tobin said. He claimed it was necessary to help during the drought. When we finally got around to talking about the treasure, he claimed it wasn't in the treasury. 
Kurian smiled at the shock on Noman's face. He told us a bandit called the King of the Caves had taken it and asked us to find out where he was hiding. In exchange, he would reinstate our exemption. He exempted us from taxes, all right, muttered Rhys. For good. That's not helping, Mr. Brock, Noman said. He also insisted that the treasure be secured at his castle when it was recovered, Kurian continued. Under a guard of our brothers, of course. He slung a bag hard over Greta's back, and she snorted and skittered away from him. Obviously, he was attempting to use you for his own purposes. Noman leaned forward and patted Tobin's shoulder. You boys did nothing to make him attack us again. He simply lied to you. I thought that anything we agreed to could be cancelled by the abbot, since we're not ordained, Kurian said. Very shrewd, Noman nodded. It would allow you to gain his confidence while moving nearer to the treasure yourselves. Unfortunately, he was equally cunning. But how did you end up here? Kurian pointed to Louise, who was still lying down and listening to them. Evasia sent us to Down River Town to question her friend. After that, she volunteered to take us to her bandit king. Louise wrinkled her nose at the description. But before we could leave, the captain of Evasius's guard attacked us, Tobin added. Noman furrowed his brows and sat silently when he heard this. That may be good news, he said after a few moments. So you're all right with your students almost being killed then? asked Rhys. No, Noman glared at him. But if he sent a captain to follow you, then obviously he was telling the truth about one thing. He does not have the treasure. Tobin let out a relieved sigh. So we still have a chance. Now what do we do? We retrieve the treasure and try to rebuild, Noman said firmly. Kurian turned back toward the pony, closed his eyes and shook his head. Noman made it sound like running an errand to Apiford. They might be able to steal back the treasure from the king of the caves, if God were still on their side, but there would be no rebuilding against the strength of Avasius, at least not in Pollingham. Thinking about the king reminded him that Alden had promised to send help if he could. Was that a promise to all of them, or just Louise? Louise and Alden were still spies. They had to be on their guard. He finished loading their supplies in silence while Tobin introduced Louise and gave Noman more details about their ordeal. Noman nodded and asked questions with feigned wisdom. Kurian could see through the cracks in his shell. Their wise teacher was a coward in the end. Dean Goodman had run when his brothers were dying. Kurian would not trust the Dean for protection or guidance against their enemies. Hopefully he would fight when necessary and otherwise leave them alone. They had barely left the shelter of the bridge when Noman interfered in the plan. We are heading too northerly, he said. We ought to follow the riverbed back toward the compound. That's not the shortest route to Dury, Louise answered. Although the river is easier to follow without getting lost, I've got a sunstone to help us keep straight. I don't think we should get too close to the compound or Pollingham, Curian added. But we have to return. Noman explained. We must perform the final rites for our brothers. They deserve that even if we cannot bury them all. Kurian's face grew hot. He wanted to lash out at Noman for treating them like his old students when nothing existed of their former home. That would be the most dangerous thing we could do right now, he said, trying to keep his voice calm. He's right, said Louise. It's likely Evasius has men watching the compound for survivors, even for these three to return. But the rites must be performed. Our dead must be laid to rest with the proper blessings and honors. Didn't you ask anyone in town for help? Kurian asked. No. Noman bowed his head. I didn't know whom to trust. And I couldn't further endanger the one friend who risked hiding me overnight. Dean, Tobin said, placing a hand on his teacher's shoulder. Doesn't the rule allow for the rites to be delayed during times of crisis? Noman nodded. I believe this qualifies. If they capture or kill us trying to do this now, our order dies. However, 
if we survive this adventure to the crags, we can return to bless our fallen brothers in time. It may not be what we want, but our duty and our oath require it, in my opinion. Noman walked away and stared into the fog in the direction of Caprick Hill. Of course, you are right about the rule, Mr. Hart, but I will never forgive myself for leaving them there, necessity or not. Then go, if you must, Curian blurted out. The dean turned toward him with a blank expression. You would like that, wouldn't you, Mr. Abramson? However, I will not abandon you. Whether you believe me or not, I could not forgive myself for that either, and it would be the more grievous sin. Of course, thought Curian. The coward has to pretend he's protecting us. We are still children in his eyes, not ready for responsibilities in the order, and certainly not prepared to be the last hope of recovering the treasure. Or follow. It makes no difference to me. Curian grabbed Greta's lead and started north at a rapid pace. Louise caught up quickly, followed by Reese and then Tobin. Noman lingered for a moment and sent a prayer in the direction of their old home. Then he turned after the others and dissolved into the mist with the road. Captain Fallon followed the attendant Geoffrey into Lord of Asius's offices and was led to a seat. He knew that he was in front of the large desk that nearly spanned the narrow room, but his vision had not yet returned. Sometimes he saw a blurred image from his left eye when he blinked, but otherwise light and shadows told him where something might be in his path. His blindness meant that he had to ask a guard from down Rivertown to guide him back to Pollingham. The guard sounded no older than the monks, and his inane questions were inappropriate for a superior. It had been a slow and degrading trip. The door clicked closed as Geoffrey left. Fallon assumed that Evasius was waiting across the desk, but he heard no sound that told him anyone was in the room. There was no greeting, no wisp of breath or accidental sweep of cloth, yet he felt eyes watching him, the same feeling as before an ambush. Even though he was tempted to speak, he trusted his discipline. Never speak until spoken to by your superiors, and never trust that you were safe from curious ears. If Evasius were watching him, then he knew this was a test. The silence remained for what felt like minutes, but Fallon only stared forward. His heart began to beat faster and louder in his ears. There was a faint scent of incense just distinguishable from the burning tallow in the lamps. It was probably lingering on his watcher's clothing. His instincts were telling him a threat was near, but the soldier inside willed him to remain motionless. Good day, Captain Fallon. He felt the breath on his ear and nearly lashed out before he recognized the voice. Lord of Asius had been standing so close behind him that he could have killed Fallon instantly. My lord, he saluted from his seat. I'm glad to see you have not lost your wits along with your sight, Evasius said, and moved around Fallon's back toward the desk. Fallon turned his face in the direction of the sound, but did not answer. I want no excuses or explanations, Evasius continued. Give me answers. Find my treasure. My lord, I dispatched seven guards from down River Town to track the monks with their guide. More importantly, I discovered that the highwayman is somewhere in the crags of the wild goats atop the Northland cliffs. Their only known paths are through Avon or Walesand. Six patrols were ready immediately, and I sent two to each city. And since we have suspected for some time that they might have a secret passage through the cliffs, two should also go to Derry. Three Capricks won't be able to hide with twenty men on the perimeter of the smaller cities. He heard Avasius click his tongue. A fair plan, Captain. As soon as your eyes improve, I want you to follow the most likely trail with a full company. When you find the thief's camp, crush them. Return with the treasure, and you will be rewarded well. Thank you, my lord. Fail, and I may hand you over to the witch. He could hear that Lord Avasius said it with a smile. She hasn't had a puppet of her own for some time. It took Fallon a moment to realize his breath had stopped. He nodded to show that he understood. 
In the meantime, I want you to see her for another ritual. Our current method of gathering information is clearly inadequate. She may be able to do something about your eyes as well. See her immediately. Evasius chuckled as if he had made some joke. Fallon did not stand for a moment, and he heard the swishing of fabric behind him again. You're dismissed, Evasius whispered in his ear. One of his own men led Fallon by the hand toward the dungeons carved deep into the rock on which Pollingham Castle stood. The white mist before his eyes turned black as they descended. A cold, musty smell at the entrance quickly turned into a nauseating wall of odor from the diseased and rotting people in the cells. He felt moments of heat and light as they passed the torches spaced along the narrow hallway. The witch worked much of her magic here, surrounded by misery and pain. It kept her out of sight so she wouldn't frighten superstitious soldiers. Fallon suspected she also enjoyed it. Hello, Captain, Muna said, touching his face. He flinched away and she laughed. Help him onto the table, she said. Private Mason led Fallon to a low table where he knew that she cut up the bodies of dead prisoners. She had also healed some of his men there. He pulled his arm from the private's grasp and dismissed him before he climbed onto the table on his own. At least it was dry. The witch prodded him around the face and chest before speaking again. Being connected with you has been interesting, Captain. I know you feel me when I reach out. I think so. It's your willingness that makes the bond so strong, your loyalty that makes you do whatever is asked. I need that for this new method to work. I was ordered, and I am here. Good. If you fight me on this, you will not like the results. What are you going to do? he asked. I'm going to enter your dreams, dear captain. But first, let's take care of those eyes. She grabbed his forehead, pulled back his eyelids, and poured a burning liquid over his face. The pain was as bad as the monk's powder, but he did not cry out. He tensed his body and pressed his head hard against the wood of the table until she had finished. This was his duty, his only way of regaining his honor. After blinking a few times, the mist faded, and a blurry image of the dungeon room came into view. You'll see clearly by morning. Nothing new for a soldier. For now, all he saw was a shadowy mass where she stood. It was better than seeing her mutilated body again. When we're done, you'll see me in your sleep, and you can give me the information our lord requires. She placed a small metal object in his hand. His skin crawled when she touched him, but he had to follow his orders. He hated that a part of him wanted more. This talisman will go under your skin. Here, she pressed one of her long nails into his flesh between two ribs. What is it? His stomach turned, his heart raced, and he felt on the verge of panic, the same feeling he'd had before his first battle. Why do you ask questions you don't want to know the answer to? She laughed again. I'll just say, you'll always have a piece of me close to you. Curia knew they were passing the most dangerous point of the day's march when they crossed the path of frayed turf from Avasius's horsemen. If they followed the path to the right, by his guess, they were only five miles or so from Caprick Hill. If any of the soldiers had stayed to wait for them, they might return to Pollingham Castle at any time. They hurried their pace into the afternoon to get several miles from the trail before stopping to rest. As they were preparing to stop for the night, they came upon a small grove of trees on the plain. A few of the trees had late apples hanging on them that were still edible, and Curian was grateful to have something fresh to eat instead of the salted meat and dried fruit in their packs. In the morning, they woke to a cold, dense fog that gave the small grove the feeling of a cave. The thin trees stood like carved pillars holding up the stone-gray ceiling. Before breakfast, the Capricks gathered for prayer. Tobin had encouraged Curian and Reese that they needed to recite at least the minimum prayers prescribed during times of travel, and had led them in the practice each morning and evening. This morning, the dean took over from Tobin. Tears fell down his cheeks as he recited the first hour prayer in his flat voice. 
The morning under the bridge had been the first time they had forgotten it, and Tobin had begged Noman for forgiveness when he remembered. Curian laughed to himself, because Tobin overlooked that the dean had forgotten as well. He expected that they would not forget again, and that would make Tobin happy. He tired of the dean's voice quickly, and he felt like he should keep an eye on Louise, so he peered out from his hood. Louise was kneeling down by the bags. Her body was rigid, and she stared intently into the thick fog just beyond the trees. She cocked her head to one side and cupped a hand to her ear. When he saw the fear on her face, he reached out and touched the dean's arm. Noman jumped when he touched him. What? what? he sputtered. Mr. Abramson, I cannot believe— he started in his classroom tone, but Curian cupped his hand over the dean's mouth. Noman slapped his hand away and looked furious. Curian jerked his finger to his own lips and then pointed to Louise. The dean finally stopped trying to argue. At the same time, they all heard the soft thudding of horses approaching on the plain. Louise scurried over to their circle in a crouch and gestured for them to all kneel down to hear her. Hide in the fog she whispered, and motioned to indicate that they should spread out. Lay down your robes. She covered her eyes with one hand. Hard to see. She moved away and grabbed her blanket, wrapped it around Greta's leads, and took the pony behind a large shrub that had grown up on the edge of the grove. Then she somehow convinced Greta to kneel and threw the blanket over her back and head. Louise hid herself by climbing under the shrub where it grew against one of the trees. The others scattered. Curian moved quickly to the other side of the grove and lay down in a small depression in the grass beyond. He did not want to get too far from Louise and give her a chance to escape while they hid from the approaching horsemen. As soon as he was still, he heard the jingle of harnesses and the thumping of one of the horses as it sped up to a canter. He laid still on his stomach with his hood over his head while his breath blew out against the grass. Seeing his breath, he realized he was cold. The horse came up quickly and stopped abruptly. Curian felt the hair bristling at the back of his neck. He could see the silhouette of the rider in the fog to his left. Ten steps closer, and the man would be clearly visible. He tried to steady his breath. Another rider trotted up behind the first, and they both stopped. I swear, I heard voices, one of them said. We are probably close said the other, but you can never tell where sound is coming from in a fog like this. We could run around in circles and pass them right by. One of them whistled loudly, and a moment later Curian heard other horses come running. He felt the earth trembling beneath his body, and the hooves of one came so loudly in his ears that he thought the horse might trample him. When the hoofbeats stopped, Curian could see at least three other riders. The fog made it difficult to be certain of their number. I think we're close, the voice said again. They can't get too far on foot, so we'll go back to where we can see the trail and wait for this fog to clear up. Yes, sir, said the others. Stay alert, boys. We may get promoted to the castle if we catch the ones who slipped through Captain Fallon's grip. The lead rider kicked his horse hard, and they rode back in the direction from which they had come. When they were gone, Curian rolled over onto his back, and let out a long sigh. Well, everything's set up for the next fight, only this time it won't be just the boys against one man. Kurian's about to get answers as to whether the Dean will help or hurt their cause. But if they all survive the encounter, what will he do about the growing tension between them? Join me next Friday for the Battle of the Apple Grove as the treasure of Capric continues. This week in the Behind the Keyboard segment, I wanted to talk about a few of the names in the book so far. Some of them are just made up. Some of them sound made up, but they're actually real, and some of them have particular meaning in the choice. Evasius is completely made up, because it was about the most politician-sounding invented name I can think of. And not to get into politics, but I always feel like Whenever I see a political interview, their superpower is being evasive. They never answer a question straight. Hence, Evasius. For his first name, Baron, nobody agrees really on the source or the meaning that I can find. At least one of the potential meanings was something about the land, and another was about being a servant. 
it fit his family history that they were previously ministers to the king before taking power. So I thought it fit, and it, to me, didn't sound like a very flattering overall name, Farron Evasius. His second, Captain Fallon, has something of an ironic name, since his Gaelic last name means leader. He's not in charge, but he is a better natural leader who inspires his men than is his lord. I also like the sound, rhyming with Talon, or slightly reminiscent in my mind of Falcon, Fallon, Falcon, which goes with his kind of hunter's attitude and his hawkish nose. Muna is an Arabic name that means desire or wishes, which is appropriate since desire is her weapon of choice. I have access to at least one Arabic speaker who can help confirm the meaning, though I'm sure I muddle the pronunciation. Heck, I even struggle to say it as Muna instead of Mona, which is a completely different name. Kurian seems to be one that people struggle with. I've anglicized it a bit, so it sometimes sounds almost like Korean. In fact, if I'm speaking it, sometimes the computer thinks I'm saying Korean, but there's an emphasis on the U, so Kurian. Uh, I thought I had made it up when I was working through Greek class in seminary. Kurios is the word for Lord in Greek, and ancient Christians sometimes became martyrs when they were asked to choose between Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord, or Christos Kurios, Christ is Lord. Obviously, that makes it a significant word. My understanding of the grammar at the time was that the ending might make it possessive, so a name that means the Lord's. I haven't kept up on my Greek at all, so I can't say whether that was correct then or now. It's actually an ancient Greek name that's got a couple of variations, and it's equivalent to Dominic in Latin. And it does indeed mean of the Lord. I was even more shocked to learn that it's still in use among Christian communities in India, though I can't say how common that really is. Tobin and Reese both have names that fit their personalities. Tobin means God is good, and he is the one with the most steadfast faith of the boys. Reese means ardor or enthusiasm, and he certainly carries that for certain things. They both have last names inspired by animals. Hart is the old word for deer, and Tobin has the, both the slender, fragile look about him and the kind of serene peacefulness that the Psalms sometimes refers to with deer. Meanwhile, Brock means badger which obviously fits Reese's nature and keeps his whole name to two syllables for a man of few words. The last one that carried something interesting was Noman Goodman, and this one shows you the wild turns an author's mind can take. The dean's obviously the most legalistic of the monks that we've seen. He wants everything to fit into what he sees as right, typically according to the order's rule, which was based on the Benedictine rule for Benedictine monks in the Middle Ages. His first name is another seminary inspiration. The tension between law and grace developed almost immediately within the church, especially as the gospel began reaching out to the Gentiles. Within a few years, the apostles realized that some of the ceremonial laws that were specific to the Jewish people, such as circumcision or dietary restrictions, were not part of the new covenant. It wasn't long before people began thinking that if they didn't have to follow some of the laws because of grace, then they didn't need to follow any of the laws, because God would forgive, right? These anti-legalists clashed with extreme legalists, who demanded that Christians essentially become Jews by following the entire law, which was probably a worrying prospect for some of the grown men who were Gentiles. The Apostle Paul explicitly argued against both of the extreme positions. Then when Martin Luther called for a return to a doctrine of salvation by grace alone against the legalism and works righteousness of the church of the time, the licentiousness crowd flared up again, suggesting you could be forgiven and still live in sin. He used the Greek word for law, namos, to coin the word antinomianism, or those who were against the law. So my brain said, if there can be antinomians, or libertines, then there can be nomians or extreme legalists. And there's Noman's name. He's a Nomian who thinks he can work his way into God's favor and salvation. Kurian is of the Lord, but Noman is of the law. And the irony of his full name is that it constantly reminds him that he cannot achieve his ends as it echoes the words of Christ, that no one is good except God alone. Even as he strives to be perfect enough for salvation, his own name reminds him that no man is a good man.
That actually sounds way more soul-crushing when I say it out loud. But there's your peek behind the keyboard. I hope that those little insights into character names enrich the story for you. I did some similar things with place names in the book, which I might explain for another episode. I'd love to hear from you if you think that's a good idea. You can send me a message or leave a voicemail with questions or comments about the show or the story by going to brandonwilborn.com forward slash contact. And I really would love to hear from you. There's a link in the description for an easy way to reach out to me. That's it for this week. Thank you again for listening to Brandon Wilborn's Fantasy Fiction. Until next time, Godspeed. The Treasure of Caprick is also available in print and ebook formats from all major booksellers. Find a link to your favorite retailer in the show description or go to brandonwilborn.com. That's brand on, not brand off. And Wilborn is as simple as you can make it. Wilborn, W I L B O R N. No extra vowels or L's or umlauts or anything else. This has been The Treasure of Capra, book one of The King of the Caves, written and narrated by Brandon M. Wilborn. Copyright Brandon M. Wilborn. <laughs>